We're going to listen to what's here. Do you know how this works? Uh, probably have heard some of it. Okay, so this is uh, my outline. I'm going to try to motivate and introduce this problem of uh, the adiabatic theorem. And then I'm going to spend some time telling you that at least some versions of the adiabatic approximation, not maybe the adiabatic theorem, but the adiabatic approximation, uh, I have problems, at least in their sort of interpretation. So I'll talk a little bit about that and see what those problems are. And uh, then I'll explain one method that we developed that solves uh, many of those problems. And that method we call it randomization because it's based in ideas from uh, uh, computer science randomization. You randomize things and you can get better results sometimes. And then I'll get to the uh, digital version of this adiabatic approximation, which is how we can solve uh, problems inspired by the adiabatic approximation and the adiabatic theorem. You have a quantum computer, and that's what we call the impact reversal. And we can get faster uh, algorithms here than just using randomization. And finally, I will argue that the cost that we get when we try to do the adiabatic theorem with a quantum computer. We can prove that this optimal. This, you know, if you try to solve this problem generally, you can never do better than this, and we have a proof of that. Okay, so this is the outline. Okay, so you know, very simply, let me just tell you what I think the derivative theorem says. It says well, you have some family of Hamiltonians and some corresponding family of eigenstates, and the relation is that if you are at some eigenstate, psi s. So s here is like some parameter for my Hamiltonians. But if I am in an eigenstate, psi s, of Hamiltonian hs, and then if I change my Hamiltonian hs, HS very slowly, so it is evolving in time, and then this particular Hamiltonian, and then I move the Hamiltonian a little bit, if I do that very slowly, then I am going to remain an eigenstate. OK, so if I, if I was an eigenstate initially, then I'm going to be an eigenstate later on. So in particular, if psi 0 is an eigenstate of h0, and it's non degenerate let's say that's the most useful case. And if I change my Hamiltonian very, very slowly, I can get to some more Hamiltonian h1, whose corresponding eigenstate is psi 1, and I will prepare my system in that eigenstate. Okay? So if you, if you do this slowly, that works. Now, the adiabatic theorem is perfectly fine. I'm, not, I'm going to talk about problems with the adiabatic approximation. Uh, but, but the adiabatic theorem that says if you do this very slowly and very slowly here means if you take a time to do this, you know, to go from here to here, if the time you're taking to the tends to infinity, then it's going to work, right? And there's a proof of that, you know, in 1950 by Cato and Messias. Yeah. So there is no problem with, with the adiabatic theorem. If you do it very slowly, then it works. But the question is, you know, how slow you should be? And that's what I call the adiabatic approximation. So the adiabatic approximation tells you there are different versions for it. But basically, this is a fairly popular version that if they break, you know, you have some gap, delta, between your eigenstate and all the other eigenstates at a particular point in your path of Hamiltonian. So you look at Hamiltonian HS, you look at the spectrum, you're in eigenstates I S, and there is some energy gap in those other eigenstates. That's the, and that's going to be very important for the rest of the time. So if the rate of change of your Hamiltonian in some norm, let's say, over the gap square, if this quantity is very small, so basically your Hamiltonian is changing very slowly with respect to the gap square, then you should. OK, so this is uh, the other question. So this is the part that I'm going to argue is problem. Okay, and actually, what I'm going to talk about is the adiabatic approximation. It's putting bounds in how slow you should change the Hamiltonian, or how long should it take you to go from there to there if you want to make sure that you end up preparing the state side. Okay, but the adiabatic theorem itself, which says that if you do this, you know, infinitely slowly, then there's no problem with that, and that's in itself. In the end, the adiabatic theorem still doesn't assume the Hamiltonian is capped. There are different versions for the adiabatic theorem. I, mean, I think yeah, there are versions that don't assume that the, that the Hamiltonian is capped. But they haven't really looked into them. I just went from what they heard. Um, you know, for the problems I've been working on, we always assume some. some. Yeah. 
Okay, so, so you know, why we care about this? Well, you know, then you have a different, or you have all sitting in different forms in different places. You know, like a geometric faces, for instance, always happen in the context of uh, somebody else's term, I guess. Uh, here in this particular place, there is, uh, you know, the people working on quantum computation, and of course, you know that there, there is such a thing, quantum uh, computation, it just means that. You can use these Hamiltonians that are easy to prepare in some sense, and therefore the final state that you prepare uh, encodes the solution to some quantum computation. And everything that you can do with a quantum computer, you can do it, you know, by slowly changing these Hamiltonians that are easy to prepare in some sense, at least to polynomial. So that's a motivation to study the theorem because it happens in the context of adiabatic quantum computation. Uh, you can also use the adiabatic theorem and adiabatic approximations for things like quantum simulations. And actually, originally, it was proposed in, you know, the, in the context of adiabatic quantum computation to solve uh, satisfactory problems, complete problems, and things like that by referring to other people. And actually, the reason why we got involved in this uh, kind of studies is because we were interested in. Uh, getting a speed up for classical Monte Carlo. Uh, which we need, and to get that speed up, we had to improve the way the adiabatic approximation was normally understood. So then there are some other works around. But basically, by improving the adiabatic approximation, we've been able to improve some classical algorithms that are related to annealing, and annealing is related to the adiabatic term. So that was our motivation. Okay, now let me just give you a brief summary of the stuff that is coming from the rest of the talk. So basically, as I was Saying there, you know, the standard versions of the adiabatic approximation, we up, they have problems, and the problem is that they are kind of slow, so we couldn't get these speed ups for quantum Monte Carlo, for instance, sorry, for classical Monte Carlo, because the dependence with the gap was not too good. And actually, they don't even work. I say often, I mean, like, you can find mathematical counterexamples. So they are not, like, you know, rigorous statements. So you can get into trouble using them. Uh, well, then we introduce a different way to parameterize these adiabatic approximations, uh, which I think solves many problems that you find when, you're study, when you study adiabatic approximation. And what we did is uh, instead of parameterizing things only with the gap and the norm of the Hamiltonian, we parameterize things with the length of the path that you're traveling. So you're studying some eigenstate side zero, you go to some eigenstate side one. That's some path of eigen state, that path has a length. And it turns out that if you parameterize your adiabatic approximation using this object, the length, then well, you can deal with unbounded operators very easily because the operator is not there anymore. You know, I would argue of well, we haven't explored this really in that uh, it can help you to deal with uh, noise and things like that. We actually get better dependence of the gap, so then we get quantum speed up with some problems. So the path uh, is this this is the length on the parameter space, right? Yeah, I will define you know the path properly in a few slides. I'm just introducing this Is the length the Hilbert space? Okay, then I'm going to introduce this first method, the randomization method, which turns out to have a scaling of uh, length of square over the gap, and is related to instantaneous space decoherence so or instantaneous decoherence. Uh, then I'll talk about this other algorithmic or digital <coughs> method that you can do to sort of tra traverse a path of eigen states if you have a quantum computer. And they also have a better cost, although I think this cost can be proved in some cases, but we haven't really done it. And actually, you know, they don't have many conditions in terms of the continuity of Hamiltonians. Well, this one actually works even if the path of Hamiltonians is not continuous, so the derivative approximates will break right away. And finally, I would argue that this causes the length of the gap. Is, uh, is the best that you can do there. Okay, so just to set the notation, this is very simple, right? You know, let's study this standard analytic approximation in the context of just a simple, you know, two level system. And this is my Hamiltonian, and of course, when it's also the NMR Hamiltonian, and basically you have like this piece that is fixed, which is this angle C, and then you have some piece that is rotating at some dimension that's frequency nu. Like that. And, and you know, this uh, thing is the gap, is just the length of that vector, and that's my instant time so I can state that's Hamilton. Okay, so this is my notation. So then you know to be adiabatic basically means obviously try that your 
Hamiltonian is changing, my Hamiltonian is basically that vector B, because this is the state that is changing very slowly. And then I have some other state side that I prepare close enough to an ideal state of my Hamiltonian, so close enough to B, and if uh, this Hamiltonian moves around, then you know, of course my ideal state forms, right? We can see what happens. And that's basically what you consider to be a derivative. This is one case that you don't consider to be a derivative, which is my field sort of has very high frequency, so my eigenstate might be wiggling around too much. But I think you know, this will be, you know, we haven't really done it with these randomization methods. This case should be fine because if your frequency is really too high and, and doesn't couple in any way with your eigenstate, you know, like if it's noise, then at least you know, in some limits, your adiabatic friends will approximately work, right? Um, that normally wouldn't be covered by the standard theoretic approximation, which assumes that everything has to be reducible. I think our methods will allow to treat that. <coughs> but what is really not adiabatic whatsoever is when you have a, a gravity plotting and you have a resonance, right? So basically, that means that this dimension is frequency. Um, well, which I'm making dimension so one other time by making S at that time. So basically, the point is that. The wiggling of your Hamiltonian is in resonance with the energy splitting in the z direction, so that's the frequency, and then you can see what happens, right? Then you get this rather floppy, and your eigenstates starts spreading around, and then you know you're certainly not adiabatic because you start pointing out and you end up pointing out. So this is certainly one case where you don't want to say that you're adiabatic when you are in resonance, okay? Okay, so let's see, you know, this is a standard flow version. What happens if you just plug in this toy toy? So this was the toy version. Uh, you know, it was derivative over time, so I'm just making derivative over S, and I'm choosing, you know, just S was this dimension of parameter, just how I'm moving along the path of Hamiltonians, and I'm gonna be moving, I'm gonna take a total time big T to go from the initial Hamiltonian to the final Hamiltonian. So then when I do this derivative with respect of time, then I get the derivative with respect of S and I get the minor T here, right? So that's the this uh, standard condition. And I'm just plugging, you know, this toy model. And the change of the Hamiltonian is basically related to this uh, dimension of this frequency nu, and we, you know, the way I wrote it, I also got a gap which cancels one of these gap squared. This is the way it's just to do the Hamiltonian. So you basically get this quantity. Just by plugging in this toy model. Okay? And my understanding of what the adiabatic approximation says is that, you know, if you obey this equation, then you should be fine. Okay? That's my understanding of the adiabatic approximation. And I, I think, you know, this can be like really small, like 10 to the minus 7, I don't care, right? Uh, so if you obey this for any choice of, you know, nu, t, delta, and theta, as long as this equation is obeyed, then you should be fine. That's my rule of the adiabatic approximation. Well, but if you go to resonance, which is obviously the case where you don't want to claim that you're adiabatic, and you just plug in the value of nu to your resonance, which is this value, then, you know, you just plug it in, you plug nu there, and, you know, t delta cancels of t delta, basically you get this equation, and you can obviously choose this angle of theta, that was the angle of my, this was my Hamiltonian, right? <coughs> so the second states of theta was this angle with the c-axis, you can make that angle very small. And you know, you made that you made that angle very small, this is as small as you want, but you are at resonance. So the Hamiltonian in the interaction picture is actually just telling you <coughs> you're rotating, which is what we saw when you're in resonance. So we do what happens when you're So all I'm saying is if you just happen to be at resonance and you plug it in this very simple standard, you know, adiabatic approximation then, you know, the approximation seems to be away, but you're clearly not adiabatic because you're going to be rotating around, you're going to be doing very flow. Okay? So that is a problem with, one problem with the standard adiabatic approximation that we want to trace. Any questions? Everybody thinks that's a problem? Yes? No? <laughs> Sorry, I'm taking that. Good, because sometimes I get people attack me when she does a I'm glad to do this. Okay, so, you know, uh, basically, right, so then it's clear, right? We want this to be adiabatic, the frequency is very slow. 
uh, the frequency will be very high, it's not really erotic, but you know, it would be good to have methods that deal with that, and that would help dealing with erotic one combination of frequency noise, I guess. And that's yet to be done, but I think our methods will be good for that. But clearly, you know, if you are at resonance, then the erotic approximation fails. Actually, you know, a bunch of other people has pointed out similar problems, and, and you know, that is a problem. There are also conditions that are good, Okay, so this is, you know, like Jensen, for instance, has a paper, Jensen, mm -hmm. the authors. Uh, uh, the, the, is the, pe the paper also with Ruskai? Yes. Okay. So they have, well, they have like a disposition inside an interval, and just start, uh, you know. So they have, yeah, that condition is this condition, that's perfectly good. As pretty much the same condition you can find it in an appendix of Stephen Jordan's thesis, which is actually good to Jeffrey Goldstone. And these conditions are fine, and the main thing is that they look at the second derivative, and also they go with the gap key. Okay? So the next thing I wanted to take a look at is, you know, what is the problem? The problem was the gap, I was checking the gap square, which is the standard one, most of the standard anyway. Some people actually look at the gap key, or is this the second derivative, right? So, what it actually sees there, the first derivative is the problem. So if you plug in, uh, well, five-dimensional analysis, you know, if I am looking at the first derivative, basically I need to, you know, this is, uh, this is energy, so I need to put the Hamiltonian on top to cancel the matrix. So basically, and this is the matrix. So any power of this thing, you know, is this going to work? I was looking at k plus 1, which was gamma squared. So k plus 2 will be the cubic case that we just had, and we saw that with the second derivative is actually sufficient. And it turns out that the answer to this question really is just, uh, no, it's not good enough to look at the first derivative no matter what power of the gap you're looking at. And, you know, you just basically do the exactly same thing, you just go to the straight model, you plug in your new resonance, and basically, you, if you obey this condition, you're going to have at least one rotation, but you can have more, so this just means that one over theta has to be less than this quantity. And you also need to weigh this condition, which basically means that 1 over theta has to be bigger than this other quantity. So this ensures that you're, you know, a lot less than 1 here. This one here, this is just to make sure that I get at least one rotation. Um, you know, because the power of this is less than 1, then uh, well, you can see why. I mean, t theta would be like this, and the other one with the case would be like that, and your 1 over theta would need to be in the middle, and then you're finding an away of those conditions. So the first derivative is certainly not going to do it, okay? That's it's just a simple observation. So the other conditions that work, look at the second derivative. And the cube of the first derivative. And if you just look at the first derivative, I guess you can have harassments and, and have, you know, products. The other problem with the standard erotic approximation is that we, you know, want to solve, and this was actually the problem for us, not the other one. The other one we really didn't know at the time. It's, uh, that you sometimes lose, lose quantum speed ups, and this was noticed by Lee Farkey initially when he did a Grover version, a, a continuous Grover search. And then, well, you know, the, the gap, so he made up this Hamiltonian that, you know, adiabatically you start the equal superposition of everything, and you go to the, the state that you prefer is the solution to your Grover search problem. And very simply, you know, the gap is one over square root of n, where n is the dimension of the Hilbert space in which you live. So gap is squared, it's just like n. So if you try to do a erotic evolution with one over gap squared, then it takes you the same you know, time that it will take you to solve this problem classically, so you lose your quantum speed up, and that's because of this gap here. So some people wrote an effort, actually in 2002, saying, well, you know, there's one way to solve the problem, we just go around and where, where the gap is closing, that's where you need to evolve for slowly, and they work it out for this particular example. So we're going to do a general version of this, and the general version is, to look not only at the gap, but also look at the, how the state changes. So that's also very important. People were not looking at this experiment too much. So it's not only that here the, you know, the gap is like that, there's only a gap in the middle, and that's where you want to go slow. It's for most of the evolution, at least in this parameter space S, to scale like this, your eigenstate hasn't really changed at all. And then all of a sudden it jumps because you have a phase transition, right? And then there's all, all this other work, uh, I think I should work on some of that maybe, right? So, okay, so the point is, you know, if there's going to be a jump in the eigenstate because of a phase transition, then you probably want to go slow there. And that's actually a signature of phase transitions. Okay. So, um, so, right, this is all the problems that I just described, I guess. 
So how we fix those problems? Well, the simplest way to fix those problems is using uh, this randomization of data. So I think it's kind of simple. So, but first of all, as I said, you know, the one way where we get rid of a lot of problems is, is, is if we just introduce this length, and that's what we were asking about, and basically it's just that you know, this is my initial eigenstate, say zero, that's my final eigenstate, so you can draw a path in cubic space, and you know, you have a velocity, right, which is just the norm of the change of uh, that eigenstate, so the, the rate at which the eigenstate is changing, right, and then you iterate the rate of change, and you get the length. Uh, so that's the length. Uh, you need to be a bit careful with the phase, because you're projecting here with the space, but that's not a big deal. And you can actually bound this length always by the number we have determined over there, okay? So basically, the thing is that, you know, the Hamiltonian, for instance, can be unbound. That's one reason why we can get into problems, but, you know, the length is not unbound even if the Hamiltonian is unbound. So you have, like, a solid length or something. The length is still fine. Can I ask a question? Sure. Please. So uh, this uh, matrix is... It's very different from the Fubini study matrix. Right? This one? Yeah. Oh, it's the Fubini study matrix. It is? It is, exactly. I'm, I'm just using this uh, phase. So this is the Fubini, is the, is the subtree. Yeah, you're actually looking at this quantity. I'm just looking at the norm of the Fubini study matrix. I mean, the, the, the distance is always order one. Uh, no, it's, well, it depends what you do, right? Uh, it's order one in two dimensional space. I'm actually at the end, if I get to it, I'll, I'll show you a problem where the distance is. So, uh, you know, L or whatever. I mean, you can make the distance be. I mean, even, even, even for a cubic, well, I mean, the distance, if you take the Jurassic one, you're the one two dimensional space. But if you just go around like this, the length is not going to be other one. Obviously, if you're not doing much, you know, the length is like how many times you are on the rocks here. Even in two dimensional space. The Jurassic in two dimensional space is sort of one. And, and then what you're thinking is like the Jurassic is always sort of one. Is that what you're saying? And in that case, I do agree that the geodesic is always on the one, but for most problems, you just don't have a clue what the hell the geodesic is, right? I mean, if you're trying to solve rubber, ah, uh, well, sorry, but bad example, because rubber actually, the geodesic, you know, it's a two dimensional space, so you're fine. Uh, well, I can cook up problems with you. Also, what I mean is that the Fubini study matrix tells you the distinguishability of the states, right? So it's one when the oh, other. Oh, and they were in point, it does. So I'm just iterating that measure. You don't in that, no. Yeah, so and that, you know, so the derivative of this thing tells you the distinguishability. Yeah. And I'm just in, you know, so, so what I'm saying is that the integrated one is not the Fubini's because you just pick two any vectors nearby or not, and you see how distinguishing they yeah. are. Uh, okay, well, I'm just treating the Fubini study metric as a Riemannian metric. I'm that, and I call it, you know, let's call it Fisher yeah. metric, is that better? You know, no, no, I just want to understand. But yeah, I mean, <laughs> so between every points, you get, you know, it's a Riemannian matrix, yes, yeah. and then you get the sum of all these things. Yeah, the sum of all the small things. And the geodesic is all, you know, you don't know what the geodesic is, and that's not the path you're going when you're doing the one. Okay, so, but actually Charles and other people said is to approach this problem of you want, you want to go from a state psi 0 to state psi L and actually related to what you're doing with the diabetic theorem and the diabetic approximation you want to remove the negative state what they say was they say imagine you can actually do projections or measurements along the path okay so you divide your path into little segments of length delta and then you know you make a projection here at s, and then a projection at s plus delta, and a projection at s plus two delta, right? So if you can make all those projections, then you just look at the probability that if you are an eigenstate at s, the probability that you, when you measure this projector, the probability that you are not an eigenstate at s plus delta when doing this measurement, the probability goes like delta squared, <coughs> okay? And that's the thing. Okay. So the point is that if you choose your Delta, so your distance between projections, equal to some total absolute error over the length, then the total you know, probability that you are not at the final eigenstate once you do all these projections goes like the number of steps times the error per, per step. The number of steps is the length over you know, the, the, the length of the whole path over the, the length of these small steps times the probability of the error one step, which is delta squared, and you know. Mm -hmm. 
Then it's cancelled, then there's epsilon number L, right? So basically you get epsilon number L. So that's what they do. Okay. And um, well, you can, I mean, this delta square is very easy to see with cuts from right. It's just that when you move along the path, then you're moving you know, to linear order, then the amplitude is changing by some amount of delta. The amplitude, but the probability is the square of the amplitude. So the probability that the projection fails, you know, goes like the square of the amplitude, which is like delta square. So that's the CMF method, which is where this thing works. So what they did was to do projections basically using a phase estimation. So it doesn't really matter if you don't know what it is, because I'm going to do them in a different way. And basically they say, oh, you know, if I project at some point, so I'm going to stay, you know, side L, side sub L of my path. Uh, this is what I want to happen. You know, I want to really project on the against that side L from wherever I guess that there was, because it was close to the against it already. If my uh, projection fails, I'll be in the orthogonal space, and then the whole thing is going to fail. So this is all garbage anyway, but, you know, with very high probability, this is what is going to happen. And if you write the operation like this, and you look at it a second, then you see that the only thing that is going on is phase decoherence. So all that this operation is doing is killing all the phases between uh, the side of the state and all the other eigenstates. So if you get phase decoherence in this sometimes second basis, then, you know, you are done. This problem is solved. So how do you get it? You know, that's what they pointed out, so we said, you know, one way to get this uh, instantaneous, so this phase coherence in instantaneous eigenbasis is to just look at what is the Hamiltonian HL that corresponds to uh, this eigenstate side L, and if you go with that Hamiltonian, then you acquire some base on the instantaneous basis, right? you acquire some phase. So if you go for some random amount of time, then you acquire, you know, some random phase, and you have to add all the phases, and that is defective, okay? So if you do that, then, um, then you get the phase decoherence that you need, and this will work. And well, you can control you know, the errors of that procedure just by looking at the characteristic function. So if the characteristic function at the gap is very small, then the gap is, so you need to choose a random distribution. You need to choose the evolution time according to some random distribution. And you want random distribution to simulate phase decoherence well enough. And that just means that the characteristic function of the random distribution evaluated at the gap is almost zero, or close to zero. Then you put epsilon in there. And that's just that equation, and then you can see where it comes from right away. And then, of course, the average cost of doing every one of these projections, because you want phase cancellation, so you want phases close to minus one, and the phase close to minus one is going to be like one over the gap times the time that you're evolving. Uh, that has to be minus one, right? So that means, you know, like the average evolution time for every one of these steps has to be like one over the gap. So that's how the gap enters into the picture. So you put it all together. And basically what you do is, if you want to go from psi zero to some other state, which I'm going to reparametrize and call it psi L for the length, uh, then I divide my path into smaller steps. So I divide my path into two L squares or epsilon steps. And at every one of these points along the path, I go for a random amount of time with a distribution that basically has that average, one over the gap. And um, once I put it all together, you know, because I'm simulating projections along the way, I get the scene effect, and then I prepare the final state. And the total cost is the number of projections I need to do, which is basically this, L squared or epsilon, if you want to put there in the cost. So the number of projections, and the cost of every projection goes like one over, you know, the gap. So the total cost is L squared over the gap. Instead of L squared, you know, gap cube or, or, or square or stuff like that. So we just have L squared over the gap. Now in the worst case, the length was upper bounded by these other quantities. So in the worst case, you get the cube gap condition. But, you know, often the path length is not scaling with the gap, so actually in the case we were looking at in particular, but in other cases, like actually when you have a phase transition, the length is often not scaling with the gap, it has slightly different scaling, so you can save a lot when you do it like that. And, you know, the one thing I, other thing I want to say about this is that, well, here we're not really looking at the first derivative. I guess we're looking at the first derivative at this point, but for sure, you know, if you want to overbound the, the, the length, but for sure, we don't say anything about the second derivative. So the point is that the standard adiabatic approximations, the ones that I know that work, have to look at the second derivative. And I saw that you, know, you generally have 
to look at the second derivative because just looking at the first derivative of the Hamiltonian, you can always have a bad luck and have a resonance. Here, because we're randomizing, we never have to look at the second derivative. Okay? And that's, that's basically because we're choosing our evolution randomly. So because we're choosing our evolution randomly, that ensures that we're, you know, almost certainly never going to have a resonance. So then we, you know, include the standard scaling of the derivative approximation. So I think, you know, this way of doing things is actually not difficult. And, you know, it's, you get a better condition. And, no, no, sorry, okay? So, so here you prove that there exists a pass or a family of passes which satisfy this condition and for which and for this the adiabatic theorem holds. But it doesn't prove that I mean you don't give the conditions for a general pass that uh, So I prove that you know if you choose a particular path randomly, then with high probability it's gonna work. But I don't prove that a particular path works. So, and I can actually, you know, bound using Markov inequalities and things like that, you know, like, what is the probability that a particular path works? But I cannot guarantee that a particular path works, because there can be a resonance, and I'm not looking at the resonance. Mm -hmm. But in general, you know, with very high probability, a random path that I choose is going to be fine. And if that one doesn't work, then you choose another one. <coughs> so, I mean, I'm... I mean, this, you prove that for arbitrary passing the parameter space, yeah. there is a function st that if you evolve s according to that t, then you have this adiabatic theorem. Is yes. that true? Okay. Yes. Okay, so that was the randomized version, which is very close in speed to the adiabatic approximation and kind of fairly physical. The cost that we're getting is not optimal. I think we can improve that. We haven't really tried using pointing else or you know just keeping track of the errors better. But the one thing we have done is to assume that we can we have a quantum computer and with a quantum computer we want to solve the same problem. So we're giving a family of Hamiltonians, we're giving the initial Hamiltonian and we want to go sorry the, yeah, the initial Hamiltonian where we have the whole family. We're getting the initial eigenstate and we want to go to the final eigenstate. And now we have a quantum computer, right? So this is like a digital version of the adiabatic approximation. Um, we call that eigenpath transversal because uh, we're going to be using gates and things like that. So it turns out that in that case, we know how to do better. And actually, a pretty good hint of how to do that is in this paper by Alexander and Bokshan, which we're working on the problem we were working before that, which was this uh, speed up of classical Monte Carlo. So they were working on that, and they actually improved our bounds a little bit. And then, uh, then, well, we worked on that. So basically, the idea is that these projections that we're making for the zero effect, so you remember in the zero effect, you know, you evolve by projecting between the states that are very close together. But if you fail, you know, which is some final probability failure, then you just keep going so the whole path is wrong, okay? But you can do much better in your projections. So you can implement these projections that basically look like a Markov chain, and this has been used by electrical in other contexts. Uh, I'm trying to think. Basically, you know, the general point is that if you are in a two-dimensional subspace, space, there is not much stuff you can do. And the two-dimensional subspace space is spanned by your initial state psi, I guess, or the, or the state along which you can do reflection psi, and the state where you want to go, phi. So then, basically, you project, and you can project doing a phase estimation. So this kind of toy quantum circuit here is supposed to be in this projection. And if the projection works, then you measure, then you know you're fine. But if the projection didn't work, then you know that you're in a state orthogonal to where you want to be, and then you implement this reflection. Uh, along, you know, you just you can just reflect along some state in, in some two-dimensional subspace, which is uh, not completely orthogonal to phi. And if you do enough of this, then because at every step you have to find a probability to go there, and that's a lot of change with the thing, then you're gonna go there, you know, with a in expectation with a constant number of steps. So, well, the way you implement these reflections is, of course, in a phase estimation, right, which looks like this. You, well, you do your standard phase estimation, then you do a reflection in ancilla, and then you do the phase estimation, and that's the same as doing a reflection here. You can do this uh, phase estimation step very efficiently, 
So uh, you just do a bunch of, well, a logarithmic number, a logarithmic one of the error number of these estimations. Then your error is a uh, very small epsilon, but you need to reflect as many phase estimations. And the precision, the, you know, the cost of this phase estimation is one over the gap again. So the point is that you have a total error epsilon in one of these reflections, then the amount of time that you need to work with this Hamiltonian scales like the logarithmic of one over the epsilon and the gap. There's no way to get around the gap. Okay, so if you can do these reflections and projections, then you can traverse this path of eigenstates, which is what you want to do. So let's see the cost that you get now. So what you do is you divide the path <coughs> into segments again. So you, you want to jump from J to J plus 1, is where the same segments as before. But actually, before we needed to choose the distance between continuous states, you know, the longer the path, the smaller the distance. We have the distance delta was scaling like 1 over the length, and that's because we were using 0, and we wanted the error to be smaller and smaller at every step. But here, because the error is going to be almost zero at every step anyway, then we can choose the distance between consecutive states. We can choose it to be, you know, some constant p. So that means that before we needed L square measurements, and now we only need L measurements. Okay? So now we don't only need L measurements, this is an upper bound on L, but normally L is considered like that. So that's where this is where the gate is going to be because at every one of these steps I do this reflex project and I do the reflection project with the phase estimation and the cost is basically one over the gap. So the total cost of this thing is the length of the path. So that's the number of projections I need to make over the gap, which is the cost of every one of these projections. So whereas before with the randomization, at least using this very crazy error of bookkeeping, I had a cost which was length square over the gap, or normal Hamiltonian square over the gap cube. Here I have only length square over the gap. So we get, we, we get a scaling with the length, or with the gap. Okay, um, well, actually, you know, to do that I was cheating a little bit because I was doing this phase estimation to do the projections. So to do the phase estimation of reflecting and ancillas, then you need to know where you are reflecting. So you need to know where you're reflecting in mm -hmm. ancillas, and the ancillas have a reading on the phase because I'm doing phase estimation. That means you know that, that means I need to know what is the phase, right? Because I'm reflecting in ancillas, so I need to reflect along a particular value of the phase. Uh, and I need to know the phase for that. So there's a way to do all this stuff without knowing the phases. And that basically is doing a non-destructive phase estimation. So it turns out that you have a logarithmic amount of copies of some state phi. Um, actually, sorry, logarithmic amount of copies of some state psi. And psi is not very far from phi, so the overlap is only one half and some small constant. Then, you know, if you have logarithmic amount of copies of psi, then you can actually prepare from those copies, you basically do phase estimation, and you can read the phase. Uh, this thing tells you how many states are in phi, which is where you want to go, and how many went to their phone or phi. So you can also keep up track of that, and you read the phase, and you haven't really destroyed anything because there are still, you know, in the two-dimensional subspace between psi and phi, which is where you want to be. So this is like a non-destructive phase estimation. And actually, once you know the phase, you can totally undo it if you want, up to some error, which in our case, we don't do because we want to move forward, right? So basically, with a sufficient overlap and sufficient copies, a sufficient overlap, better than one half and copies logarithmic, you can read the phase without killing your state. So then, you know, if you don't know the phase and you want to do the same trick, what you do is you just keep measuring the phase, and then once you know the phase, you know, you can do the same thing as before to put these copies where they need to be. And actually, well, here I'm explaining uh, how this operation works. Um, but I guess there's a technical detail. So you basically have many copies, and you know, you do like majority voting in the copies, and you fix things so that you know you're reading a little bit of information from every copy, but not enough to collapse anything. Okay, and the final thing is uh, how you actually manage to divide the path. So this is for the case where what you have 
is a phase transition, uh, but you don't know where you have a phase transition. Okay, so if you have a phase transition, as you know, the eigenstate at some point, like Catherine Grover, is going to be changing drastically. And if you don't know where the eigenstate is going to be changing drastically, it turns out that you have to go slow all the time. And you have to go slow all the time because otherwise you can get to the phase transition and you're just going to totally break your computation, right? So until now, I was also cheating a little bit in assuming that I could divide my path properly. And if not, it's when you have to use these other bounds, these bounds here. But in true that you have a general compute, you know, a quantum computer, the same way that you can get the phase without destroying the state. You can actually try to measure without destroying the state. And, and basically the point is that uh, well the point is that if you measure and and you discover that you cannot you know project where you want to go because maybe you're almost with one up, then you can undo all this stuff, okay? So assuming that you can do that, and I'll talk a bit more in this slide how you do it, then basically what you do to go at an optimal speed and really scale with the length and not with the solar quantity is you try to go faster and faster and faster all the time until eventually you crash. But when you crash, you are not dead. You can just sort of backtrack a little bit. And, and then, you know, once you backtrack, you basically recover all your state again, and then you start speeding up again. So by doing this uh, CD procedure where you're changing your speed dynamically, you sort of adjust to the phase transition. So if you want this method actually finds a phase transition for you. If there is a phase transition along the path, this method will tell you where the phase transition is. But, but you are assuming that you know how the mean gets scales. Yes, that's how it's going to be. If you know that, I don't know where it is. Yeah, we well, don't work on that. That's a good point. All the time, I am assuming you know, some bound. Yeah. And I haven't really worked on how you can fix it. You know, because I'm doing the phase estimation, and the reason why I can undo everything is because the, the phases of you know, like different states, or at least the state I care about in those states, so, you know, don't mix too much, so there is a, at least a gap that I can distinguish with the phase estimation. If I don't have that gap, then my phase estimation kind of scramble anything, and I don't have to recover anything. No, no, my question is, assuming you are, you are in a finite system, so you have a gap. Okay. And that in order to implement this algorithm, you must know how the, the gap, how small is yeah. the gap, yes. uh, how, how it's scaling with the sense of the system. So yes. my question, question is, if you have this information, how can you not have information on where the, what is the, the point of meaning that? Okay, let's, um, let's say you have a bound on the gap, a bound, not necessarily good knowledge. <coughs> and maybe you know where the phase transition is, but you don't know, you know, the exponent, if you want, in your language, of the phase transition. So you know there's a phase transition somewhere, but you don't really, you know, how is this uh, fidelity measure, you know, spot in, uh, looking for the particular phase transition? So this will yeah. end up. But yeah, you need the bound of that for our methods. Uh, uh, yeah, we haven't really tried to go around that, but we will need, you know, whereas other things like dealing with noise and high frequency stuff, I think the same ideas will work, but, you know, dealing with uh, not knowing the gap. Yeah, I haven't really thought about that. Probably we need more ideas. Yeah. Uh, Okay, so the way you can implement these non-destructive jumps is by, well, you see, you know, this, what I was doing before is I was going from here to here, trying to jump to there, and if uh, the jump was not successful, then I will come here, and then I will like, move around here. So you can transform, you know, use a slightly different circuit, which I'm not going to go through, but basically the point is that if you don't jump here, then eventually instead of ending in the perpendicular state to this one, you end up in the perpendicular state to this. And either, you know, if, you, if, if the state psi is not completely, is not too close to phi, paradoxically enough, then you either end up always here or here. So you just work it out and then just what you get with a little bit of care. And it's a very simple quantum shift. So it's the same story, you know, then you repeat this a number of times, and the only sync of this Markov chain is this sync, well, and this sync. So you end up in one of those two. And again, you don't have to repeat this many times. So that's the way you do this long destructive jumps to sort of find, you know, how fast you should go out of the phase transition.
Okay, so. Wow. Can you know what this is? Interesting. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I don't know what that came from, but okay. Oh, I have a spear. <laughs> yes, sorry. <laughs> you guys didn't notice that. <laughs> well, yeah, if you, you try to see the recording, it'll be more obvious. But there's still some sound from the hanging place. Oh, maybe something was here. Sorry about uh -huh. that. I think he was in a flicker of the lights if I forgot to tell him to But I didn't notice anything in the lights. Did you? Yeah, I did. Did you did? I didn't know that's what it was. Oh, okay. Yeah, I just got into my natural mode. <laughs> I totally forgot. Okay, anyway. So these are, you know, if you have like a digital computer at your disposal, this is a summary of uh, the stuff we know you can do, which is kind of complicated. But there are, you know, like all these different conditions, I guess, related to, you know, I know my overlaps, and then I can find the faces and everything else, or I know my faces well, and in that case, you know, I am pretty much optimal, or, you know, there are like different conditions. This one is kind of tricky and is the weakest one that we know. And basically, that means that even if you don't know the overlaps and even if you don't know the eigenfaces, well, maybe um, you can guarantee that the phase of your eigenstate is never the same as the phase of other eigenstates. Okay, so as long as that doesn't happen, then, you know, everything still works. I don't know if that reason happens in our systems, but I think, you know, this is reasonable. So we're looking at the icing, you know, when the icing change for that, but that seems to be okay. So as long as the energy is never exactly the same, that's the weakest condition that we can find. And then we call that, you know, what's the production of some deltas? We call that eigenphase dominance. And in that case, everything is still working and you pretty much Okay, so the last thing I wanted to mention is that all these complicated <coughs> digital algorithms are actually optimal. And this is related to the path length that you were saying at the beginning. So the way we prove that it's optimal is cooking up a problem for which uh, the path length is arbitrarily large. And in the Oracle model, anyway, so meaning you have access to the Hamiltonian as an Oracle, but you're, you know, standard thing. So at least in the, you know, very complexity model, like speaking, uh, I can make my class long, and unless the cost, you know, the number of calls to the query to the Oracle, so that's how we measure things in this particular picture, and if the number of calls to the Oracle scales with the path length, then I can guarantee that you are not going to prefer the final. So I can, you know, make my password. So basically, the way we do that is by, uh, well, you know, it's an oracle, so we have like, some secret word X, and then we cook up these uh, Hamiltonians that what they do is, what you give J, uh, you know, what they look like this. This is exactly how the Hamiltonian, Hamiltonian look like, where it's CJ is this thing. But basically, the idea of this uh, Hamiltonian is that it's an oracle for the next bit. So if you know the first j bits of your secret word, then you can sort of run this Hamiltonian to find the bit j plus one. Okay? If you don't know the first j bits, then this Hamiltonian is going to do you no good because you really don't know, you know, because it's just not going to affect you really. But if you know the first j bits, then you can find out the next bit. So then, um, so then basically you concatenate these Hamiltonians and you know you get a path and you can actually measure the path with this you know Riemannian Fisher metric. You measure that path and you get to the path is the number of bits. Uh, so it's the very big in the bits of the cubic space, the number of qubits. And actually um, well I put my gap there so that's can just to the left. Oh no, sorry, it doesn't enter into that. That's just the gap. The length is still there. Okay. Uh, well, every one of these things, of these Hamiltonians, is really a fractional oracle, which does what I was describing. You know, first checks if the JD is, if you have the JD, the first JD is of XY. So you can actually translate this into a more standard oracle problem, meaning that you can translate one call 
do this Hamiltonian as a function of Oracle, two calls to the more standard looking Oracle Hamiltonians that kind of look like that. And this will be the Hamiltonians for a problem which has been studied before, it's a search problem. So you're searching, searching in an order database. And well, for this problem, there is a beautiful bound. So we can use, you know, and the bound for this problem is n, so you need n calls, so the number of bits. And the same bound works for us. Uh, therefore, they're pretty much done, you know, using uh, some logarithmic equivalences. That because the you know because you know you need n calls to this Hamiltonian problem uh, um, because we know that calling uh, this oracle you can get this oracle and the other way around then you're gonna need at least n calls to this Hamiltonian and that basically means that because n is the length of the path that you need to work for the amount of time that the scales with the length of the path mm. and actually we can do a bit better because you know you look at how this bound this proof and this proof using the adversary method. Uh, so instead of using results actually by Daniel and some other people about how to go between fractional oracles and more standard oracles, you can just directly cook up the adversary method in the continuum, which is where we're working, and the adversary method directly gives you this bound length over the gap with the lower ethics that you get from the, lower, from the fractional oracle to the standard oracle. Conversion from this sort of more general paper. Okay, so anyway, these are my conclusions, and that is nearly there. Thank you very much. Any questions? I have one, so the, it could be a bit speculative, but I'm wondering, is there any home relation you think random walk, or the quantum walk to the same problem? You have kind of such elements, right, in the algorithm. Uh, sorry, can you repeat? Well, the home is the example, your algorithm, in terms of the random walk or the quantum walk, is this possible, or it's nothing to do with it? For this one, or for the randomization one? Oh, for the your quantum algorithm. Oh, for the quantum algorithm, I see. You think the phase is too much? Uh, that it looks like a quantum walk? Well, I don't know. I mean, it could be the classical or some phase space. So the question is if it looks like a quantum walk? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, it's I think there are some technical reasons that I haven't really talked about at all that I hear under the rock for which it kind of looks more like a quantum work than what I explained here. <laughs> because basically, you know, for me to be like a quantum work is you're like in a superposition of different sides. And the way I explain it here, it looks like you're always in one particular side along the path. Uh, but there are technical reasons for which you actually, for this whole thing to work. If you want to put bounds on the maximum number of steps, if I remember correctly, maybe you have to do it for human. But I am not sure right now if that was important or not. If it is, it's a very simple thing. Okay, but if we take this picture, then we could consider still quantum walk, but we could introduce certain decoherence, right? Into some eigenstates. And this is my question. Oh, you can introduce decoherence? Yeah, and this is, can oh, we well. are you in this picture? Or it's just, you know? So this is for this part here, the algorithmic part. Right. But I know, you know, that if the decoherence is on the instantaneous eigenvalues because of the, oops, because of the previous part, mm -hmm. then um, then you know, if the decoherence is instantaneous phase decoherence, then that actually helps for sure. Yeah, exactly. Uh, other type of decoherence, I haven't looked at it. I mean, there are results, uh, you know, by actually a language group, which is where I am right now, on uh, how decoherence helps for exciton transfer and photosynthesis, which is very nice because actually in nature, in China, they have, you know, this one works on photosynthetic complexes. And, and to really explain the efficiency of the energy transfer, you need 
two things. It cannot be only classical, so you need quantum effects, but you actually need the coherence on top of that. And they're actually working. When they do that, they do it numerically, and they, they put really like a you know, bosonic environment, a room temperature, and stuff like that. So it's not the, you know, the coherence as instantaneous phase coherence, which is the one I'm looking at. So it is possible that also in this case, the same way it helps them, you know, for the random walls and the complex. <laughs> It might also help here. I don't know. I mean, there are indications that that might be the case. Actually, this works by timing, I guess, too. So there are indications that that might help. I haven't really, you know, but or check it in line five. It, it's possible, I guess. It's interesting. Thanks, thanks for sharing. <laughs>